In 1984, Wes Craven entered the nightmares of the entire cinematic world with his horror icon, Freddy Krueger. Let's break down everything that went into making Craven's terrifying classic, A Nightmare on Elm Street. What's up, movie friends? Welcome back to Raiders of the Lost Podcast, the ultimate film and TV podcast, and it is spooky season. It's almost Halloween, and we thought we'd revisit one of our favorite horror classics on its 40th anniversary year, all the way back in 1984 in November, A Nightmare on Elm Street was released, and it changed horror forever. Uh, horror was becoming a slasher genre and a graphic one at that. Wes Craven himself made The Last House on the Left for his first film, Hills Has I- Have Eyes for a second film, he did a sequel as well, so he made a bunch of slashes before he got to Freddy and A Nightmare on Elm Street. But what really changed things with Freddy is how he brought in surrealism and abstract storytelling thanks to the use of dream worlds. And things like circ- uh, spinning a room or flipping a room upside down and having these incredible sets and breaking the rules of reality. This changed everything. It hadn't really been done like this in horror ever before, so he freed up. Uh, the landscape of horror filmmaking for other filmmakers and inspired generations upon generations. And there's a reason why Freddy Krueger is, without a doubt, one of the most iconic slashes of all time. Uh, this is one of my favorite horror films. I think it's it's perfect, even for the time. Tiny budget, but they still pulled off some amazing stuff, and I can't wait to break it down. It's crazy how influential this movie still is. When you look at a show like Stranger Things, which is the hottest thing on Netflix every time it comes yes. out, the influence of movies we've talked about in the past have been on there, but... A Nightmare on Elm Street specifically with the upside down. It's very much like A Nightmare on Elm Street because Wes Craven's playing with this theme of a dream world existing at the same time, the same field, but kind of upside down in a way or in a different dimension Mm -hmm. of reality. And you can enter this dream world. Obviously, Inception is kind of like this as well, similarly. But it's more of a real-time sort of thing like the upside down is in Stranger Things because as we find on this movie and you watch it, you can enter a dream world and it's sort of happening at the same time. And you can pull things out of your dream world. You can pull Freddy out of the dream world. So (laughs) it's really interesting. Or can you really? Or is it all just a big dream similar to a big horror franchise that just got its second film recently it it also reminded me very much of a nightmare on elm street as well with delusions and what's real what's not real with smile Mm -hmm. smile too but a nightmare on elm street a film whose influence and legacy is still going i mean there hasn't been a movie since 2010 though which was i think every ranking i've seen of it online has it as the worst one from 2010 it's it's terrible yeah it's really bad and (laughs) we can talk about that in a little bit um but I have I actually have a whole thing to say about the remake, but yeah, we'll get into that. We'll in a get into bit. that. But there have been nine movies in the A Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, grossing a total of four hundred ninety million dollars globally. We have A Nightmare on Elm Street, A Nightmare on Elm Street Two, Freddy's Revenge, A, Night- a Nightmare on Elm Street Three, Dream Warriors. Number when f- Wes Craven returned. Number four, we have The Dream Master. Number five, The Dream Child. Then we have Freddy's Dead, the final nightmare, which we found out wasn't the final nightmare <laughs> because then Wes Craven's new nightmare came out in 1994. And then we had Freddy vs. Jason, turn of the century 2003. And then A Nightmare on Elm Street in 2010 was the last time that Freddy and this IP was tapped for a cinematic world. And Heather Langenkamp as Nancy was in three of them. The first one, the third one, and then New, new Nightmare. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So she was in those three. And Wes Craven, like, wisely brought her back for the new Nightmare. Number three is actually really good. The second one was awful. Wes Craven wasn't involved in New Line Cinema. It was just like, we want this second film done immediately. Because the first film... Now, I know if you watch this, it, this has average ratings. It, I think it's because it's a little cringe. And it's obviously... What, what ratings are you looking at? I guess IMDb. 7 was 7.4. 7. 7. 7. That's high for a horror film. All right, yeah. For a horror film? Yeah. 7.4 is great yeah okay and then Rotten Tomatoes it's a 93% critic score 84% audience score yeah. really good numbers so I don't know what Letterboxd it's Letterboxd is a 3.4 I think it's a horror movie yeah you know? I just I this sh- I think should be held to a higher standard because what Wes Craven did on such a small budget 1 million dollars uh, and this ended up grossing 57 million so it was a 1.8 mass- it went a little over budget. 1.2 is what I saw well then eventually it's 1.8 total okay that total the, that was the final number alright anyways <laughs> He started with 700k though. So so I can, yeah, so New Line Cinema was the only studio that was able to that agreed to make this film. He had the script in 1982. He went to every studio. He had been making movies like we said for years. 
and every studio passed on it. Uh, another, stu- I think it was Fox wanted him to make it PG thirteen. Walt Disney. Walt did. Disney. Yeah, obviously. They but wanted he, a preteen, family-friendly PG-13 <laughs> movie. <laughs> but he wanted to obviously stick, obviously stick to his guns and do what his vision was, and he, he came into contact with New Line Cinema, a pretty new studio at that time. They had never actually funded anything. They were just a distributor. And so this was their first time actually funding a movie for production. They gave him 700 k and then they had to get more money from other investors because it wasn't enough for the production budget. They actually went into production with 700 k and they weren't able to pay cast and crew for the first two weeks because they didn't have enough money so then they got private investors involved and they were able to pay everyone what they what they were allotted a lot came from this yugoslavian guy they said oh really as well as 30 to 40 percent respectively got from investors in england and also new line cinema is known as the house that freddie built yes because this was they did lord of the rings right new line cinema uh yeah they became one of the biggest powerhouse studios outside of the big name ones Uh, they've always they've been a huge studio for decades now and this really like I said, this was their first time producing a film, not just distributing one. And it really built their their studio. Uh, this is a massive hit to make $57 million, but then Wes Craven didn't want to make a sequel. He actually wrote a happy ending for this film, and he wanted to end it with that and never visit Freddy again. But New Line Cinema wanted a dark ending so that they could, if it did well, make a sequel. So he made actually four endings. Three of them were bad. One of them was good. I mean, in terms of the, how, the outcome for Nancy. A new line chose the film's ending that we know today. And Wes Craven actually wanted the happy ending where she saved the day and went to school with her friends. Uh, he didn't want to revisit Freddy, obviously. And then New Line was like, all right, we're making a sequel. Let's, we're going to get going right away. Wes Craven didn't want to do it. So they hired another director and fast-tracked a second film that was just really atrocious and awful, but still made good money, $30 million on a $3 million budget that one made. And then... Wes Craven came back. I'm not sure how they convinced him, but maybe he was like, you know what? There's a lot of potential here. He actually co-wrote the third film with Frank Darabont. On the way. Hence the strength of that movie. The third, Shawshank Redemption. Yeah, the third film is a really good uh, sequel. In the, it's the best sequel in the Frey, Frey franchise. I haven't seen all of them. I've seen like six of them. It's the best one for sequels that I've seen. And then from there on, Wes Craven was all aboard Freddy from then on, the Freddy train. I guess if I'm in his shoes and I created this what came out to end up being this horror icon that people had uh, obsessed, became obsessed with, like like Mike Myers mm-hmm. and, and Jason Voorhees. I feel like, you know, I didn't do the second one. If they're going to keep doing them, I might as well. This is my baby in a lot of ways. I would yeah. be like, I want to go back. And I, they're not doing it the way I would do it. They're kind of ruining they're it. They're fucking it Let up. Let me fix yeah. it. And obviously, I'm so lucky to make movies. That would be my perspective. Like, fuck it. Let's just do another one. Yeah. And obviously, reunite with your friends and get really creative. And they probably, I guarantee, after the failure critically of the second film, they gave them complete control of the franchise. And when it comes to influence, I think this movie also has an all-time poster. Yeah. It's absolutely incredible. Right here. We have Freddy uh, coming out through the dream of our lead character, Heather, who looks like she's just waking up from a nightmare under the covers. But we have the finger gloves, the knife glove. Over her head, it's just an incredible image as well as that spooky, like, ghoulish skeleton of Freddy's face. It's it's absolutely sensational. It's There's one of the also, best like, a ever. Nosferatu vampire right here. Yeah. With uh, two fangs. One of the best movie posters of all time. One of the best horror movie posters of all time as well. It's insanely creative and, and connects so well to the story. And the inspiration behind A Nightmare on Elm Street has its roots in real events. So it was based on a real-life story where in the 1980s there was this epidemic of people dying in their sleep during nightmares... They were mostly immigrants from Cambodia, and the condition became known as Asian Death Syndrome. Wes Craven read an article in a newspaper about this and got the idea for a serial killer who stalks victims in their sleep. So to quote Wes Craven, he said, I had read an article in the LA Times about a family who had escaped the killing fields in Cambodia and managed to get to the U.S. Things were fine, and then suddenly the young son was having very disturbing nightmares. He told his parents he was afraid that if he slept, the thing chasing him would get him, so he tried to stay awake for days at a time. When he finally fell asleep, his parents thought this crisis was over. Then they heard screams in the middle of the night. By the time they got to him, he was dead. He died in the middle of a nightmare. Here was a youngster having a vision of a horror in the middle of the night that everyone older was denying, that became the central line of a nightmare in Elm Street. And then to quote the article that he read that had this whole sequence, it was in Chicago, this was published. 
and it was published in 1987. And so it starts, since April 1983, at least 130 Southeast Asian refugees have left this world in essentially the same way. They cried out in their sleep, and then they died. Medical authorities call this Asian death syndrome. The refugees have various names for it, one of them being night terror. In the Philippines, it's called Bangungut. In Japan, it's called Pokuri. In Thailand, something else, Dr. Robert Kirshner says. But in all, it all roughly translates as the same thing, nightmare death. These are all healthy men with no previous symptoms. The average age was only 33 years old. And the situation was always the same. And it occurs in men in their sleep. And their report is they cry out and die or and or are found that dead the next morning. Now, whoa. Standard autopsies revealed little about the deaths other than that they were caused by a sudden heart stoppage. Such an occurrence in Asians is mystifying since their rates of ordinary cardiac disease and malfunction are extraordinarily low, primarily due to their low-fat diet. It is Kirshner's theory that something in at night, perhaps a random electronic discharge, and yes, perhaps a nightmare, overloaded these defective hearts, causing the sudden deaths. So that's that article was published in 1987, LA Times. Wow, that's weird. Pretty that's wild. really crazy. And so and then Wes read a couple of stories and read the story about the, the specifically the, the young boy who died. Uh-huh. Wow. That's but for really... some reason, it happened mostly to many Cambodian immigrants. Well, it could be like a genetic uh, issue. Maybe. A very, very, very rare one. Wow, that's wild. Who knows, man? They would never solved it. Well, he came. he used it as a basis of a, a really brilliant concept of this slasher monster who kills people in their dreams. And uh, this is such a, a brilliant film. The filmmaking is amazing. The sets, I mean, there are a couple shots where we watched it last night and we were both just like, oh, fuck, that's so good. It's great, man. It's incredible. So much it's, practical. It's all yeah, practical. It's all practical. And, and the sets are really ingenious. Ironically, as iconic as Freddy became, he only has seven minutes of screen time in this movie. Isn't that wild? Feels like so much more. He has more in the other films. He's got a lot of scenes, yeah, though, but they're exactly. just really snippets here and there. He has a lot of screen time in the, in the remake, which we'll get into later. We don't need an origin story. <laughs> but really, it's the ingenuity of the team and the great vision of Wes Craven uh, with the brilliant surrealism and the meshing of reality and dream world where you get really great, uh, amazing filmmaking. I love so many of these sets. Like, Obviously, I mean, a highlight of the film is early. It's Tina's death. It might be the best. It might be the best scene in the movie. It's up there, where they built a, a room that could rotate and spin, and so they kept the actor who played Roy, uh, Rod. I mean, obviously strapped to the uh, one of the walls next to the camera, so we could see his over the shoulder the whole time. And the camera doesn't doesn't move its position, and then the actress playing Tina, uh, Amanda Weiss, she was freewheeling, and they spun the room upside down. And she is falling upwards from our perspective of where it's shot. And she's falling up to the ceiling. Uh, and it's just an extraordinary piece of filmmaking. And uh, Nolan talked about his if this influence for Inception, obviously, in building a, uh, the, not what's it called? The, not a centrifuge. What did he build? Centrifuge. Oh, it was a centrifuge. Yeah. Okay, never mind. Yeah, that's what he did build. <laughs> it was a centrifuge. And this is just an incredible piece of filmmaking. And then the wire work of her being lifted afterwards. And then I also really love the, the bathroom set piece where uh, Nancy is pulled through the bathtub into what seems to be an endless ocean of water where Freddie's trying to drown her. And it's just so incredible. It's a simple bathroom set, but then having this really abstract piece of surrealism where the bottom of the tub doesn't have an end. It doesn't have a bottom. And her just getting pulled out of the bathtub. It's such a simple set, but it works so brilliantly. And they perfectly cut from underwater in the depths of that water tank they filmed in. And then the overhead in it's her arm reaching out from the bathtub. You've never seen that image before, like someone reaching their hands up a bathtub. It's so striking and so so original and so unique. And then I really love uh, Glenn's death, Johnny Depp's death, where they obviously built put put the set upside down and then poured a copious amount of blood, copious amounts of blood, a surplus, <laughs> surplus. It sure was a surplus. Through that bed, and we see it from the perspective of the bed being on the floor, so it just flies up into the air. Uh, it's so incredible, so iconic, and it's so genius, but it's very simple. Like, how do we get this blood to go upwards, spill the room upside down, and pour it out the ceiling? It's so ingenious and so brilliant, and this whole team just put together something really special, which is why it's lived on with so many films, and to this day, still inspires other filmmakers, and 
And also, I'm sorry, the, the famous Freddy stretching the walls, which you saw on Stranger Things, the first season, through the wall. Um, it's just so many great practical effects and set design in this film that really put it above anything that had come before in the genre. I'd love to explain some of those effects. Yeah. So obviously that wall of ceiling drag was accomplished by this rotating room that was developed by mechanical special effects designer Jim Doyle, who won uh, an Academy Award for uh, the Dry Fogger. And it was a hairy situation, call, uh, is what Wes Craven called it, because they did no wires, actually. So this is which Just set? Just vertigo. This is the, Tina? the rotating room for, uh -huh. for both of them. Um, obviously, wire work for when she levitated, for sure. Mm -hmm. But they what they did was... They had all the items nailed down and the cameraman strapped into what was they called an airplane seat <laughs> and attached to the wall. Same thing with the actor in the foreground. So they basically strapped into these seats in these chairs that they were seatbelt into. And it took several crew members on either side to actually flip the room because it wasn't mechanical. So they had to actually physically flip oh. the room themselves. So they had just a bunch of crew doing that. For that blood geyser, they used the same same set. They just dressed yeah. it differently. So it's the same room, the same revolving set used for Tina's death. And same thing, cameraman and Wes Craven were mounted in fixed seats taken from a Datsun B210 while the set rotated for that sequence as well. And again, they said the crew inverted the set and attached the camera so that it looked like the room was right side up. Then they poured water through the room. I think over 300 gallons of water was used in this movie, most of it used in the sequence. It looks great, too. It's like a perfect color. And there's also on the TV movie version of mm -hmm. A Nightmare on Elm Street... In addition to blood, pour, Glenn's blood shooting out from the mattress, his skeleton and his corpse shoots out from the mattress oh. as well. It's a bit honky. It yeah. doesn't look amazing, which I, I think is why they didn't include it in the theatrical version. But you can find it on YouTube. That must be why that line from one of the officers, it makes more sense where he talks about what's left other than the... He says something about more than just blood. Yeah, and I mean, there's a behind the scenes of Johnny covered in blood and his uh -huh. shirts covered in blood. So it didn't work. It doesn't look amazing mm -hmm. because it, it just didn't it didn't feel right. So the tub obviously accomplished with a bottomless tub. The tub was put in a bathroom set that was built over a swimming pool. It's a simple oh swimming pool. Oh, my God. During so the underwater sequence, Heather Langenkamp was replaced with a stunt woman during those scenes. And also the melting staircase. Don't forget that cool oh, it's little so good. set piece. So that was done. It was Robert Shea's idea. It was based on his own nightmares. And that was used making every time she took a step on, on a, a stair. Uh -huh. a, and each step, her foot would go inside. It was made with like pancake mix and, oh. and milk. So it would be like Bisquick. Bisquick? Mm -hmm. Bisquick? Bisquick. Yeah, so it was just pancake mix. So that's why it's all goopy oh. like that. Um, <laughs> oh and God. then where the sequence where uh, Freddie... And his face and hands stretched through the wall and reached for Nancy when she dreams. That wall was built by Doyle, the special effects guy, out of spandex. So that's why oh. it's so flexible. And then when you release it, it goes right yeah, rigid, it rigid. rigid again. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So just all practical, in-camera, simple stuff. Just kind of wow. a lot of it household or just figuring out great mechanical engineering. It's And I mean, these things, as uh, amazing as they are, the illusions are just like a magic trick. Very simple. And oftentimes, it's the most simplest thing is the answer for the trick. Yeah, I would say the most complicated thing was probably Freddy walking through the jail cell bars. He just walks through them like mm -hmm. a ghost. They did that with two different shots, and then they had someone rotoscope. I would say the spinning room. Spinning room, was yeah, it's complex. Because yeah. then she had to get her blocking right and not get hurt. You know, I'm sure they spun it pretty slowly, but... Yeah, I mean, she's, yeah. That shot only works because Rod's right next to camera in the foreground. Yeah. That's why the shot works so well. And it's just brilliant, and, and it's, it's then he blends together the surrealism with the real world in a lot of ways, whether it be uh, Tina walking through the school in the the bloody body bag and things like that. Yeah, and then the invisible line pulling her yeah. body down the hallway. It's really great stuff. I think one of my favorite, even even though it's super honky, and it doesn't hold up, I guess, really, but it, it looks it's still so fun, is one of the first times we see Freddy when he's down, or not the first time, the, the second time we see set, see Freddy, he's outside at the end of the streets. Mm -hmm. He's being silhouetted by moonlight. Calling her. Yeah, yeah, and he has his, like, 10-foot arms stretched out. <laughs> it's so <laughs> funny. And it's just, the silhouette of it looks ridiculous and absurd. Then he cuts to a close-up of his hand in the glove scratching the wall. Mm -hmm. It's just a normal hand. And it's just, like, it, it looks ridiculous, but it it's works so well at the same time. I remember being horrified when I was a kid. Yeah, it's creepy, Those man. Those things scared the hell out of me it when worked. I was a kid. It really worked. And... Speaking of the dreams, what they also captured with the blocking and the action of the actors is I really love this movie because it's funny in a way that you're like, oh, my God, they got that right. There's so many times where Nancy's running and no matter how fast she runs, she doesn't even go that far. Yeah. Like there's a like shot. Nightmare. Yeah. There's a shot of her in the hallway sprinting. 
they must have done something with putting her on a treadmill or something because she's clearly running, but she's barely moving forward. Was it Nancy forward. or Tina? It was Nancy in the school hallway. Gotcha. Because uh, there's a scene like that in the opening in Tina's yes. first nightmare where she's sprinting, but she's not moving at all. She does it also as well. And then um, there's multiple times where Nancy runs, one time across the front yard, and she's like running slowly. It looks, you think it's silly, but you're like, you got to remember, there, she's in a dream. And that's what happens in dreams. Like, you can't escape the monster. Um, you you like can't even run correctly sometimes. And you're like, honestly, you're like incapable of escaping sometimes physically. And it's ridiculous. Like, sometimes you can't move your legs. So they captured this and it really works. Like, when you watch the movie, you understand that you're in a dream, that she's in a dream. You're like, this is what happens to all of us when we're being chased by a monster in a dream. And it's really fun to see on screen. I, I've never seen it really done like this. And it's so spot on. It, it makes you, it makes me chuckle. Because I'm like, oh my god, that's so good that they even thought of that. It's so simple. Yeah. And I guess for some people it doesn't look great, but if you understand exactly what it is. The context. Yeah. yeah. Like, people might look at her running and be like, why is she running like that? It's so silly. But it's like, she's dreaming. It's a nightmare. Yeah. And the nightmares are so great in this movie. And it's obviously the ambience, the mood, the mood, the atmosphere, and the locations are great in the dreams. But it's really Freddy that sells this movie so well. Robert England is phenomenal mm-hmm. as Freddy Krueger. The casting was originally going to be with david warner he was all set makeup tests were done but he dropped out due to scheduling conflicts and then replacing him at first was kane hodder who would later be best known as the fellow slasher icon jason Voorhees. Oh my god among those who west craven talked to about the role for freddy and according to hodder i had a meeting with west craven about playing a character he was developing called freddy krueger at the time west wasn't sure what kind of person he wanted for the for the role of freddy so i had as good a shot as anybody he was initially thinking of a big guy for the part. He was also thinking of somebody who had real burn scars. But obviously, he changed his whole line of thinking and went with Robert England, who is smaller. I would have loved to play the part, but I do think Wes made the right choice. Harder would, in a way, eventually play Freddy as the hand that grabs Jason's mask in the epilogue of Jason Goes to Hell the Final Friday, where he's obviously grabbing the Well, mask. did he end up pl- playing Jason in Freddy vs. Jason? No, he no, wasn't that Jason. That would have been great if they actually got to do that together. Yeah, and Freddy's such an incredible character. And according to Craven, you know, in a sense, Freddy stands for the worst of parenthood and adulthood. The dirty old man, the nasty father, and the adult who wants children to die rather than help them prosper. He's the boogeyman and the worst fear of children. The adult that's out to get them. He's a very primal figure, sort of like Kronos devouring his children, that evil, twisted, perverted father figure that wants to destroy and is able to get them at their most vulnerable moment, which is when they're asleep. And so much iconography from the character lives on still to this day, and everyone loves the design of Freddy Mm Krueger. It's really brilliant, you know, that the knife glove, you know, Craven said, he also said the serial killer should use something other than a knife because... It was too common. So many slashes was just a knife or scissors or something like that. So to quote him, he said, I thought, how about a glove with steak knives? I gave the idea to our special effects guy, Jim Doyle, who's a fucking MVP of this movie. Ultimately, two models of the glove were built. The hero glove that was only used whenever anything needed to be cut. And the stunt glove that was less likely to cause injury. For a time, Craven considered a sickle as the weapon of choice for the killer. But... Around the third or fourth drafts of the script, the iconic glove had become his final choice. Sickle, sickle would be too Grim Reaper-y. Yeah, and it's kind of odd. Yeah. Big shape. Yeah. And, and Freddy, what I love about the glove is in about the opening of this movie, yeah. you get this little short film <laughs> of great. Freddy in his workshop, and he's getting his he's getting geared up to haunt the nightmare of Tina. It's it's really fun, and the he's aspect suiting ratio up. is tiny. <laughs> it's sick. It's fuck. It's super villain suiting up. I was um nodding like Jack Nicholson watching the opening credits. Me last too. Night. I was, I was like, yes. like, this is great. It's a great opener. It's awesome, man. It's a great opener. I don't look at it as him in the dream getting ready. That's before he was killed by this. That's like his when he was still alive. It's possible. Yeah, yeah that's how I look at it. Here's the thing, though. What's so cool is you don't. In this film, you don't know how Freddy got this power, what he's doing, or or we don't get any backstory to that. We just know how he was killed and who he was before he was killed. And I like that about this film, keeping that mystery alive and not having too much lore about what exactly is Freddy Krueger, how is he doing this beyond the grave after his death. So I want to ask you, how do you think Freddy Krueger has become this nightmare killer? Oh, well, I'm... I've always thought about it, and I've never, I haven't seen all the movies, so I don't know if it's been explained in movies. Has it been explained in any of the sequels? I think it has. I can't remember though. So, but just talk, just off this movie, I would, I would say it's probably just a curse. 
Yeah, um, mm-hmm. uh, maybe something about the, the local area because obviously Elm Street is very important and he's only haunting the people on Elm Street, only the locals, some specific kids. He's not haunting the parents. So maybe maybe he was into some satanic stuff, some some rituals himself, some spirituality. Maybe he had done some experimentation and the co- when he got burned alive inside his boiler room, I don't know, maybe maybe there's something supernatural that was that had, that was something that, uh, that was about him before he died and yeah that carried it over into the afterlife with him entering a dream world or maybe the way he died in the location i don't i have no idea honestly it's never- like um i, I cuz there are crucifixes multiple times in this film and then it's part of the song the crucifix so it's fun it's it's and we also get uh that that little monologue from a priest so i think there's a lot of demonic um catholic christian uh themes in this film yeah yeah and so you could look at freddy in this film as he's a demon he became a demon in the afterlife sure and now because we always think of demons as the ancient beings from the bible you know what i mean all those old weird names like bulbazar or something balthazar <laughs> beezebub close enough beezebub <laughs> there you go you're thinking of, of constantine constantine yeah um balthazar balthazar like there's all the all the demons are like ancient beings. We don't think of demons as being like more contemporary beings. So you could look at Freddy as being like a he became a contemporary demon, new hot young demon on the block. I wouldn't call him hot, but <laughs> he's hot. He's burned alive. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a really good one. My, one of my favorite things about rewatching this movie and the thing is when you when you live in L.A. or you move to L.A. or in California, you palm trees become a very consistent thing that you see outside you see palm trees everywhere yeah socal they're everywhere yeah they're everywhere there's this movie set in ohio but there are palm trees everywhere the fucking in the cemetery (laughs) and that's because they shot this in la uh they couldn't afford to shoot on location la was very inexpensive at the time uh they couldn't afford with this small budget to put a whole production into a different state across the country so they shot la for ohio and it's really funny when you watch this movie knowing that you start seeing palm trees everywhere. It's like The Office. The Office is predominantly shot in Los Angeles. So whenever they go outside, there's always palm trees on the roads and sidewalks. If you can catch them. They're yeah. pretty good about it. But if you, Oftentimes in cars, if when they're driving. through the car windows, yeah. you can kind of spot you'll, palm you'll trees see the, You'll see them when they're driving. Um, you'll see palm trees. Um, but this is the same thing. Like You see, start seeing palm trees everywhere. And they even go to the, the Glenn and, and Nancy go to the Venice Canals yeah. for that, that awkward burger meetup. <laughs> and it's just like, they're the Venice Canals? This is Ohio. It's so funny. But most people wouldn't know that they that's would, the Venice yeah, Canals. Yeah, no idea. But the palm trees are, yeah. I, I guess some people, either they accept or they just never noticed. I think people just accept that when the illusion of the film's working, they don't question things like that. It's just like the James Cameron thing or the um, the Abyss Swipe, you know, you know, yes. the, yeah, the, yeah. where the camera guy wiped the lens with a cloth or with his <laughs> hand <laughs> under when they were in the with the water sequence, and no one knew. The editors never saw it. James Cameron never noticed it until the internet just started dissecting everything that has ever existed the last fifteen <laughs> years, and people dissected that, and they found the cameraman wiping the lens on the camera during the abyss, a big climactic moment. No one's ever noticed it because it's. Like you said, the illusion of the movie is so powerful and so strong, especially in a specific moments, that all you can think about, all you can see is everything that's happening in, in the film, in the story, and it's the power of cinema. Yeah. The power of film. And no one notices palm trees that are in Hawaii, Ohio <laughs> in Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> and Halloween. Yo, well, Halloween is filmed in Yeah, yeah. yeah. Halloween yeah. also filmed in oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Fake leaves. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we... <laughs> Got some shit for that when we made a couple of Yeah, people gave a shit for fake leaves. There's legitimately fake leaves in Halloween, (laughs) Mike Myers, because they filmed in South Pasadena in summertime. Not that leaves don't fall in LA, not a lot of leaves, but it's definitely not maple leaves. It's not like New England, (laughs) but there are some some trees in LA drop leaves, kind of, here and there, but not the accumulation of that's Mm -hmm. somewhere with dense forests like in New England or somewhere cold. No way. And so they made fake, they had fake leaves on the sidewalk. They they would Mm -hmm. sweep up for takes. It's really funny. I used to be absolutely horrified by Freddy when I was a kid. I still am. I was. I'm not really scared of him anymore. I think it's because we're so. I'm so numb and tolerant to horror films. Well, <laughs> but well, I'm, yeah, it's not like I'm like looking around the corners yeah. of my house that I'm, I'm afraid of him. But I think he's just terrifying. Yeah, oh, he's terrifying. But I just find rewatches of those rewatches of this movie 
to be so fun to watch filmmaking wise 100% because of how creative it is and how I mean for this small budget like keep in mind this was made for less money than the Friday the ter- 13th reboot I mean sequel that they made that same year it was made for uh, 5 million dollars less than Terminator also made that year was made for which everyone says that was a low budget Terminator Terminator was made for 7 million dollars 6.4 million dollars what the yeah holy crap 6.4 million James Cameron pulled that off how did he do because he's a fucking man, man. He's the man. Well, I guess today that would be like 25 mil. It's a good budget, but I yeah. mean, it's a lot. it looks a lot bigger than that. It looks like I'll tell you how he did it. Miniatures. Miniature. <laughs> fucking miniatures, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's how he did it. So this movie, 1 point whatever, 1.2 or 1.8, which might have been the final cost when all said and done, that's nothing compared to the Terminator budget. And everyone talks about how low the Terminator budget was. Like this was, they were using scraps and they put it together. And you do see that budget in the supporting cast. You know, some of the actors aren't, you know, it's kind of funny. It's a little cringe, their dialogue. Uh, but the leads are great. The leads are very strong. Uh, Heather Lagerkamp's great. Johnny Depp's good, but, I mean, he's super young and early in this, in this role. And he doesn't have, like, his Johnny Depp stuff yet. I, I was getting Chalamet vibes yeah. from him. Like, Chalamet ah. and Lady Bird vibes or young Chalamet. Chalamet I, I was that. better at that age. Yeah, but, but he, was, he was, you know, doing theater and everything. Yeah. Johnny was a musician. Yeah, exactly. This is, like, his first big thing. Because he actually got cast. Johnny Depp got cast in A Nightmare on Elm Street because the actor who was cast as the coroner in the movie recommended this musician friend of his who played in a rockabilly band for the part of Nancy's boyfriend, Glenn. This ended up being Johnny Depp and obviously created one of the greatest movie stars of the last 50 years with this yeah. movie. He became one of, he became one of the actors of his generation talent-wise, but he didn't, obviously, he had no training or much experience at all before this film. But, I mean, it's still great. He did a great job for, like, having no prior experience. He's just a very attractive young guy. Yeah. And according like, to Depp, he, he it was Glenn was written as a like a big blonde jock uh-huh. football kind of guy, whereas he doesn't look like a jock, even though he's called a jock. But I believe Wes Craven said his daughters picked Johnny Depp based off his headshots that were showed to them. <laughs> <laughs> so he got he got his the Johnny Depp began his career because he was just so attractive, very attractive yeah, and very charming. Attractive, and yeah. and Charlie Charlie Sheen was originally wanted to be cast as Glenn, oh. but according to reports, there are multiple reports. According to that one report, Johnny, I mean, Charlie Sheen wanted $3,000 a week, which they couldn't afford. However, Charlie Sheen himself objects to that sentiment that he turned down the role of the, for the reason of money, saying, I didn't price myself out of it because I didn't get greedy until years later. That came much later. I just didn't get it, and I've never been more wrong about interpreting a script. I just did, didn't get it completely, but I still took a meeting with Wes, and when I met him, I said, Look, with all due respect, as, as a fan of your talents, I just don't see this guy wearing a funny hat with a rotted face and a striped sweater and a bunch of clacky fingers. I just don't see this catching on. So Charlie Sheen says he just didn't get it because he didn't get it. Johnny Depp, I bet he loved the idea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he ended up doing Edward Scissorhands. That's true. It's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> he saw it perfectly. He's Holy like, crap, I, I know your vision. <laughs> I love it. What a great connection there. <laughs> I never made that connection before. Me neither. That's why we get paid the big bucks. Johnny Depp is in A Nightmare on Elm Street. Then he stars as Edward Scissorhands. Yeah. Pretty cool. But I guess say Heather Langerkamp is a really great lead in this film. She does an excellent job. Um, and in a third film, um, I think she's just like a perfect final girl. But what's also cool about Na- Nancy is... She fights back. She's like full Home Alone style at the end of this movie. Yeah. She, she goes after Freddy multiple times. She's like, I'm going to get that motherfucker. What I love about her booby traps is she has <laughs> that big sledgehammer that she leaves outside the door. She's got a couple things here and there. And then she puts a bunch of gunpowder from shotgun shells in a light bulb. Why not just have the, <laughs> the shotgun ready to go, Nancy? Just like grab the shotgun. Sh- because you're bringing him into the real world. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a cool effect. It's like a little explosion, but... Just pop the guy with the, the shot in the chest would have done better. Maybe she couldn't find the gun. Yeah, maybe she just found the shells. Yeah. I think they just wanted to show that she was she had a uh, good ingenuity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. She's a survivor. She looked up. She read the book of booby traps. Also, I mean, did Home Alone rip this movie off? Maybe did Home Alone rip off Nightmare on Elm Street? It's possible. I mean, it's pretty similar, especially that sledgehammer hit. Even the montage, funny. it's like a yeah, a, the montage, it's yeah, like commando music, it's <laughs> gear up music. And there's some um, for such a low budget. There are some incredible shots in this movie. But I got to say, one of the best shots in horror history, it's still, and it's copied with the remake, it's Freddy's glove in the bathtub moving closer to Nancy's open legs. Uh, And it's just iconic. It's genius. It's brilliant. It's so foreboding. 
and dangerous. And it's like the juxtaposition of that. And that's such like a, a vulnerable state to be in for her and for the hand, the knived hand to be right there. It's so incredible. What a great shot. It's the best shot of the movie. It's one of the reasons why the, the, that remake was so bad is they're copying so much from the original. Of course, remakes always copy and, and pay homage, but this is one of the best shots in horror history. Yeah. And is Jade, Freddy's knife fingers coming out of the bathtub. And they didn't do it as good either. But Freddy's look in general, besides the gloved hand, is really incredible. His wardrobe, he wears the red and green stripes, and that's a jumper that was picked by Craven after he read in a science journal that they were the most clashing colors to the human retina. Um, he also was mm. partially inspired by a man who scared Wes Craven as a kid. Now, the man was drunk, wandering down Wes Craven Street, wearing a hat similar to Freddy Krueger's hat. He he woke Wes up while Wes was inside of his house. When, when, when Wes went to the window, the man looked straight at him. Craven was so terrified, he ran to wake up his brother. Also, Freddy's first name came from Craven's childhood bully. His name was Fred. Hmm. Still that Craven remembered this encounter for so many years speaks to how potent and terrifying it truly was, and also Freddy's face. And just like how Wes Craven was looking at the horror icons of the time, machete, knife, knife, mask, 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 Leatherface, Mike Myers, Jason, whoever you're talking about, he wanted his villain to have a mask, but be able to talk and taunt and threaten. So thought of him being burned and scarred to have that sort of represent the mask for the character. Yeah, it's a great character design, and it, they... It, it just looked greater even in the second and third films. Just a really good design and some fun prosthetic stuff with, like, they melt his face in one movie. It's super cool. Um, but I, I love the design of Freddy. Great Halloween costume. And I feel like throughout the course of, like, the last 20 years, every once in a while you see someone and they're wearing, like, a red and green striped sweatshirt. By, and they don't, they're not referencing the movie. And it's just like, why would you wear that? <laughs> I feel like I've seen that multiple times. Just someone wearing that color coordination. And it's like, why would you do that? Yeah. It's Freddy Krueger. What's, what's so interesting about it is, obviously, we usually connect that with Christmas. Yeah. In the holiday season. Green and red, yeah. And then you have it with a horror icon or in a, in a villain. And it's just so interesting that it works so well. And it's, it's so sort grizzly. Of, it's sort of as a no-brainer. You can't imagine Freddy Krueger or anything else. Because the other characters, you know, Jason, Mike Myers... They're sort of obviously just in outfits that are not invisible, but they're not conspicuous. You know, it's a green, a gray jumpsuit or just a big trench coat and big pants. And then Leatherface obviously has the more of an iconic wardrobe, I would say, with the leather butcher apron. But with Freddy, it's so vibrant and colorful and, and just eye-catching with stripes of red and green that you can't help but look away from the wardrobe. It's so eye-catching. It's so interesting. And Rob Raglan brought a lot of fun suave humor to it and Did you say eggland robert england <laughs> Did I, say I, de England? I definitely heard egg i said eggland i was like who's robert eggland Egg <laughs> eggland's best is that egg brand eggland's best eggland's best yeah is that an egg yeah it's an egg brand like of, a uh, yeah. carton of eggs yeah eggland's best Just google it you never had eggland's best let me look at this eggland's yeah. best yeah they're great is that a uk america thing uk thing no yeah, it's here they're in a white container let me let me double check it but, um, England's best yeah, eggs. England's, oh, it is. Yeah, you've, you've had them. I used to get them all the time. Oh, Whole, I know this brand. Yeah, yeah they're yeah, Whole yeah. Foods. I've never... This is one of those things where I just grab the eggs. I don't care about the name manufacturer. I'm just like, all right, here are eggs. They're good eggs. They're they're a little expensive, but they're the, they're the best. Them. I've had them. They're the best. They're not the best eggs. They're Eggland's best. They're not the best, though. No, they're not the those best. Those past... Uh, yeah, the $10 yeah. eggs are the best. It's the dark blue label of Whole Foods that you... It's like pasture-raised, grass-fed... $9 it's for not Whole 12. Foods, though. You get it at Whole Foods. Oh, yeah, you, you get it at Whole Foods. You get it at Whole Foods. Yeah. Whole Foods. I can't Those are Unless you're getting, of course, eggs from they got They got like a red yolk. Yeah. The real deal, Those man. are good, man. <laughs> After COVID, they went up to $10 a pop, though, oh, for 12 that. I'm like, I, I'm not paying $10 for a dozen eggs. But back to the movie. Back. Robert England, he brought so much charisma to the role that I'm sure, like, with Craven's original ideas, a hulking body, uh, a really intimidating presence... He made it fun and maniacal, and he uses great body language in this film. And they expand on it in other films. He has a lot more screen time in the other movies, and he gets to play with his, his food more often. In this film, obviously, seven minutes of screen time, he's mostly kind of just running around. But he's having fun. He's having an absolute ball. Yeah. But and that's what really works. Freddy's great. He's terrifying. But my man needs to work on his ground game. He's terrible it's, at grappling. It's Wes Craven, bro. He's terrible it's at wrestling. It's Ghostface again. It, it, <laughs> 
just can't he can't seal the deal. He's got Nancy by the arms like twelve times. She hugs him and he doesn't stab her. Can't, he can't get her, man. Like, <laughs> bro, you know how easy it would be with knives for fingers to kill somebody? It's, I'm yeah. just kidding. I'm, it's I'm, it's ghost faced all but over. But it again. works. Yeah. Like when he's running, he's chasing her down the alleyway, chasing her up the stairs, down the stairs into the cellar. It's campy. But it works so well, and it harkens back to all those times you're playing like hide and seek with your friends in the dark or mm-hmm. Relivio, which is like basically what that is. And you're just terrified. You're running around the house. You're scaring each other. That's what it really feels like: is hiding and being chased, and you can't escape it at some point. And this score is propulsive. They went super synth on this. It's it's either piano, uh, minor pianos, uh, notes and chords, and then. When there's an attack, it's doo, 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 doo. it's a crazy synth, and it you can feel it in your body when it's playing, and it's a lot of fun. I think the music really propels this movie forward. Yeah, it's propulsive. Yeah. It's energetic. Yeah, it keeps it going. It's it also light at times, but also keeps that whole fairy tale feel to it because there yes. are a lot of different elements to this movie with the atmo and the ambience and sound design. And I think you know whenever we're dealing with the fairy tale aspect of it, it's really interesting. It's almost heavenly or a different world there's almost like three worlds in this movie we have the real world we have the dream world then we have a fairy tale world and usually the fairy tale world is where the girls are playing hot, uh, jump rope and they're saying that freddy krueger rhyme one two he's coming for you. you three four better lock the door five six grab your crucifix seven eight eat, eat a, a steak, steak. <laughs> So, <laughs> I like get how that far. The, there's sort of three worlds, and then obviously the ending of this better movie, stay awake. Yeah, better stay awake. The ending of this movie is very much like a sort of fairy fairy tale mixed with a nightmare, because obviously the ending we'll, we'll talk about later on. But I, I like how there's three sort of worlds in this movie. And with the production design, I feel like whatever. At first, they did a great job of tricking us into not knowing we were in dreams yet until extraordinary stuff happened. But then they started using smoke a lot more in the latter half of the film because we know Nancy's going into a dream. Uh, so they, they did some really cool techniques in the production with haze and with lighting um, as like signals to we're in dream world now. And also there is, like you said, there's that there's a synthy dreamlike ethereal theme for dun, 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 that you always hear for me that was like the dream like score uh melody in the film yeah then also the third act everything kind of gets blended where mm. nancy's awake in reality but dream things are happening freddie's sort of teetering on the edge of he can it seems like he can sort of interact with the real world a bit i think because when you're staying awake for so long like nancy's been awake for seven days I think because she's so delirious, that gives him power in the real world. Something is my like guess. that. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Because obviously the finale, she she answers her phone, which rings even though it's off the hook. And Great. it's Freddie's mouth and tongue are on her mouth and tongue as well when she answers the phone. Gross. And her mom's just drunk as hell. Her parent, Nancy's parents are terrible. <laughs> it's awful. Her father's just this cop who acts like he cares, but he doesn't have time for it. And doesn't wake her up 20 minutes later when he says he will. And then her mom's just... <laughs> Either gaslighting her, they're both gaslighting her. <laughs> yeah. Just boozing all the time. How many gin bottles are hidden in that home? I know, seriously. So pull, many gin bottles. The towel drawer. She's just <laughs> getting she's getting loaded constantly they're everywhere. And just hiding things from Nancy, gaslighting her. Obviously, Nancy, by the way, was the inspiration for the name for Nancy and Stranger Things. Oh in this movie. yeah, yeah. Um, but her parents were te- are terrible. Terrible parents. They love her, but they're really not trying to protect her, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, her mom, Margie, even has Freddy's glove still. Yeah. To this so. day. <laughs> but Marge and all the gin bottles. And it's, a, it's a fun rewatch because it ends up being like a running gag in the movie. Like, where's she going to pull a gin bottle out of this <laughs> I know, time? right? It's insane. <laughs> when she pulls it out of the towel closet, it's hilarious. <laughs> it's so funny. All right, I love it. There's so much to break down when it comes to the film itself, the narrative and the story. Yes. Which I can't wait to do. I loved talking about the background of the movie. I did too, man. But how about we run to our intermission, mm-hmm. have some fun games. Let's dream into the intermission. And then we'll come back to the episode and break down the movie itself from a narrative filmmaking standpoint. Sounds now, good. before we continue, the best way to support Raiders of the Lost podcast, you all know the drill. Become a patron today at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost podcast. You get access to the ad-free version of every single episode if you want to listen to this episode without commercial breaks. Just sign up on Patreon as well as the weekly bonus episodes we do 
all go directly to Patreon only. It's the only place to listen to them, everybody. Also, you get access to our Discord, you get free merchandise, video messages, access to watch parties, all kinds of stuff happening on Patreon. Also, it's just the best way to support us. So become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Another great way to support us. Leave those five-star ratings and reviews on Spotify and app. I know, I know, every podcast says, leave me those five-star ratings and reviews, please, because... I know there's no difference in your voice. Me neither. It works. It's what pe- it helps people get seen by new listeners, helps our show get seen by new listeners. It helps us chart on the podcast platforms, which are highly competitive these days. These five-star ratings also add reputability to the show. People will be like, oh, that show's got a good amount of ratings. We're at over 2,000 on both. They'll be like, maybe I'll give it a listen. We're at almost 3,000 Spotify. That's pretty wild. Yeah. And that's because I've been annoyingly persistent during the intermissions. And I say, (laughs) do the thing with your fingers and your thumbs, everybody. You know the movements. (laughs) If you're listening on Spotify, hit follow and and, and give a five-star rating. Same thing with Apple. Apple, you can leave a written review, which I'll read one in just a minute. If you leave a written review, I am going to read it on the show. Come on. It's a win-win for everybody. He we learned how to read just for this. Exactly. I have never knew how to read until we started the podcast, and I said I should learn to read so that I can read out these written reviews. Also, subscribe on YouTube. Another great way to support the show, just share us with your family and friends. Share us on every, any podcasts. Share YouTube videos. Share us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, all the things, or just text everyone. Bomb them episodes of our show. Thank you. Bombs away. This episode, of course, like always, is sponsored by our friends at MoviePosters.com, the number one place to get your posters online today. Be sure to use our promo code Raiders10 at MoviePosters.com to get 10% off your order right now. They have a huge selection of every movie and TV show imaginable in their poster library, as well as a ton of spooky season posters. Halloween is next week. Whoa. This weekend. Wow. This upcoming weekend. Did you get it's yourself on like, some- It's on like Wednesday, dude. Halloween is like on Wednesday, dude. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's on Thursday, the 31st? Thursday, yeah. 31st? Okay. It's yeah. on Thursday. Next week. <laughs> like, <laughs> wait, uh, whatever. Whatever it Thursday. is. Thursday. Whenever it is. Not important. What's important is getting yourself a spooky season poster. I don't know if you got any. I did. I stocked up on them. I got American Werewolf in London. I got Dracula right here on my right. And then, of course, I got the title episode today. A Nightmare on Elm Street. One of the coolest posters ever made. These are all beautiful prints. Great prices. Only available at movieposters.com. They have all sorts of sizes and framing, and they even have backlighting for your poster needs. So if you haven't gotten yourself any horror movie posters this spooky season, get on that right now. Right now. Correct that wrong, and make sure you go to movieposters.com, our dear friends, and use our promo code RAIDERS10. That'll get you 10% off your order right now let's get into the intermission and begin with framed.wtf where the website gives you movie stills and you have to guess the film let's before see. you run out of guesses you have six total the first image has two women two people walking in front of a silhouette of a sunset I, it's a man and a woman is that michael kane maybe or no, no. Hmm. i have no idea <sighs> i have no idea this is a good one hmm. i'm skipping the silhouette looks very familiar this looks like it could be an Italian film, but oh uh, no! Yeah, wait, is I'm it... moving on. Hold on, I got, I got a guess. Make a guess. What is it? What's your guess? He's got. He's just mirror. Type, he's just a mirror. No, nah, the mirror. mirror. All right, next shot is two characters in the foreground of the shot, looking on at a castle in an or in, in a nice valley down below. <sighs> They're in. It looks like they are possibly in Italy. Yeah, possibly this looks Italy like Tuscany. or the UK. Moving on next. I'm no going to go with the, the Omen. Let's see. Got it. Oh, the next is the, is yeah, the cemetery. Yeah, that's Gregory Peck. Yeah. It's Greg, that was Gregory nice Peck's silhouette. Yeah, there you go. I yep, thought there he was Damien, so Damien in yeah. the back seat. Nice, nice job. God fucking damn. It's, 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 oh, man, that was a good one. Good, good job. Those are good selections. That first one, I was like, who is that? <laughs> who is I know that silhouette. I know that hair. Okay, Anthony, are you ready for the rest of the intermission and starting with the movie quote competition? I'm ready. Here we go. You have the, ra- you have the right to remain silent, so shut the fuck up. You have the right to an attorney. If you can't afford an attorney... We will provide you with the dumbest fucking lawyer on earth. If you hire Johnny Cochran, I'll kill you. <laughs> Is that Rush Hour? No. <laughs> sort of similar, like same ballpark. Idea. Yeah. Um, 
You have the right to remain silent. So shut the fuck up. You have the right to an attorney. Attorney, if you can't afford an attorney, we will provide you with the dumbest fucking lawyer on earth. If you hire uh, Johnny Cochran, so, so I'll familiar. kill you. Sounds so familiar. I don't know. Lethal Weapon 4. Oh, Chris Rock. Chris Rock. As, ah, as Lee Butters. Oh, man. You have the right to remain silent. So shut the fuck up. <laughs> oh, man. That's a good one. Good one. All right. Two people talking. Oh, man, this is a completely different tone from yours. <laughs> it's a right turn. No, please. I'm Polish. I'm not German. Then why the fucking coat? I'm cold. Huh. One more time. No, please. I'm Polish. I'm not a German. Then why the fucking coat? I'm cold. Pianist? Yes. Yeah. It's like the one, the, the joke at the end of the movie. Yeah. Quite the quite the difference from, from Lethal Weapon 4. Quite the difference. Anthony, guess this movie release here. The Wedding Singer. You're going to be Julia Gulia? <laughs> <laughs> Julia's name is going to be Julia Gulia? 1990. Fuck, how old is this movie? I'm going to say 1998. Bada bing. You yes. got it, guys. Wow. Nice job. Why the total surprise? Because it, you, you seem so unsure, and I was like, he's not going to get this. <laughs> <laughs> I was collating. <laughs> We're, We're still, still collating. collating. <laughs> what year did the village come out? 2004. Ding, 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 ding. Two for two. James is crushing it. Well done. Pop quiz time. Anthony, who directed Ronin? He also directed... <laughs> The original Manchurian Candidate in 1962, Seconds, and The French Connection 2. I fucking love Seconds. Oh. It's literally on my letterbox top four right now. <laughs> is it this, really? This is embarrassing. Well, this is the, who's the director? <laughs> he also did De Niro and Ronan. I can't remember. John Frankenheimer. Frankenheimer. Sorry, John. He just unsubscribed. <laughs> it's literally my top four right now. <laughs> That's embarrassing. I love the movie so much I can't remember the director's name. <laughs> Who directed? The Pianist. Polanski. Polanski. Correct, Mundo. Three for three. Perfect record, James. Thanks. Batting at a thousand. A thousand. All right. That's I I, I want to thank the fans. <laughs> I want to thank God. I want to thank the world. <laughs> okay, that's enough. I want I want everyone to love each other. And you know, I, I won't ruin I won't spoil this opportunity. And with my platform, I just want to <laughs> promote positivity. So thank you all so much. <laughs> it's like a, it's an athlete speech right there. Oh, <laughs> uh, we play good in uh we play good, we good, play good. good. I think we could to get out there. I think we could get out there. All right. We got a bunch of unsubscribes. First up, Guy Emmas. Oh, wait, I did that yesterday. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. So, our fan Xander, per our recommendation, watched The Fly with his girlfriend, or could be wife, sorry, if she's listening, and I didn't screenshot that part. Wow, Anthony. His significant other, who is an ER nurse, but she still was extremely disturbed by The Fly. <laughs> Because I'm sure she's seen some shit yeah. on a daily basis. But still, The Fly was horrific to her. And Xander said, I'm going to have to unsubscribe for this one. She keeps yelling at me, why did you make me watch that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Xander. <laughs> Mason Kunstler. A very consistent unsubscriber with great jokes. I'm unsubscribing because James just called the Lopasaurus from Jurassic Park the big fan head ink blotting guy. <laughs> <laughs> Again, big fan head ink blotting guy. <laughs> That's James's description of the Dilophosaurus. Was it? But you knew what I meant. You knew what I meant. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Exactly. Only one dinosaur spits ink. <laughs> Just saying, you knew you knew exactly who I was talking about. Very scientific, James. LOL. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh man, that was good. I figured I knew someone's gonna get me for that one. <laughs> Didn't get past Mason at all. All right, next up we got Troop Vi Troop Vader, the Chenobites unsubscribed. I think it's Cenobites. 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 I can't remember. 
What did you say? Cheddar, cheddar bites. Cheddar bites? Yeah. Cheddar cheese bites? <laughs> the cheddar bites. Cheddar bites. <laughs> the cheese. All right, next up we got Daniel Audie. I'd like to use my one Spotify comment to pitch you guys an idea for your next project. Airbees. <laughs> a legacy sequel to the popular Airbud series, Airbees follows a swarm of bees down their luck. Oh, down on their luck, <laughs> working at the fast food chain Arby's. <laughs> they have the meats. After seeing how well the bees operate the grill, a Genovian AI sports scout played by Leo DiCaprio uses an algorithm and finds that the bees would be perfect for the Genovian lacrosse team. <laughs> what, a, <laughs> what a picture. If you don't make this, I will be unsubscribing. I kind of love it. I wrote, my God, it's genius. Thanks, Daniel. That was brilliant. <laughs> That's pretty great. Down on their luck, group of bees. <laughs> Swarm of bees. On our 70 by, 75 best movie monsters list, uh, Nick wrote, James, you pronounce bal- you pronounce ball rag wrong. Unsubscribed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Nick, Nick shared me in that, that comment. Good. That was a good one. Because I actually, I didn't say ball rag. <laughs> Like I normally do. Also, in the movie uh, Monster episode, Jazzy Jeff wrote, if whoever approved the Rings of Power script isn't on this list, I'm unsubscribing <laughs> for being the biggest monster of them all. That's pretty funny. That's a good one. <laughs> Next up, we got, also in the episode, Jay Hoban. If Scrappy Doo is not on the list, I'm going to have to unsubscribe. Oh. I forgot about him. He's fun. He's fun. Dezanzi Su- Suchan. Sorry, I hope I said that right. He definitely didn't. (laughs) This is a cool one. Listening to this episode again because I'm in a Trani, then going on a trip to Rome to see the shooting locations for the talented Mr. Ripley. Amazing. You guys made me love this movie so much, and for that, I have to unsubscribe, guys. I can see my house from here. So they're in Italy touring the talented Mr. Ripley locations. Yeah. Very cool. That's going to be awesome, especially all the Venice ones. They, uh, They tagged us in their story on a boat. I can't remember what town they shot Mangiabella in because it's not a real town, but they shot it somewhere. In I'm sure Southern. they have it on their yeah. on their itinerary. So cool! Very that's cool. that's really cool. That's awesome. You should take a boat out. In that. I think they shot a lot in Atrani. Maybe no, they shot all. Of, they shot all of it in Atrani. That's where they shot the Mangiabella, Atrani. I can neither confirm or deny. That's what it was. That's what it was. But yeah, Mangiabella. It's not a real place. Cody Johnstone. Hearing my comment read on your pod, fine. I'll resubscribe. There we go. <laughs> Thanks, pal. That's how we get him back. Welcome back. We treat you all with so much respect. That's how. We mess up and then we lift you all up and give you all a voice on our show. 75 scariest movies of all time. You didn't put scary movie on the list? Unsubscribe. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That was a good one. I like That's that one. That's a good one. joke. All right. That's a dad joke and a half. <laughs> we had a real hater today. Ooh. On what? Tiki Talk? Uh, on, on YouTube. Uh-huh. This is a funny one. Hold on, sorry. Let me just scroll down. Oh, to they're it. vicious it's, on YouTube. When the haters come on YouTube, yeah, they are, they're pretty. They're pretty they're mean. Insane. They're pretty mean. Because I mean, they've been doing it for twenty years, man. Hating. Yeah, on, they've been hating on videos for a while on there. Yeah, they said. Let's let's hear it, man. <laughs> Hold on, I lot. I mean, it's not pulling up on the comments anymore. Maybe they deleted it. It should be right here, but I cannot. Did I, you reply I, to it? I, um, I reply to it. So did you take that filter off? Yeah, I took off the filter, replied. What was, um, do you remember any keywords? Okay, Bob Belcher. Bob Belcher. Yeah. On our Smile 2 episode. Okay. He said, the intermission ruined it for me. I didn't come to this, this, I didn't come to this video to listen to two guys talk about nothing. Not returning. Fast forward to the rest of the episode. And then I wrote, this is a podcast. Just fast forward. Also, that was 45 minutes in. No, that was like 55 minutes in the intermission started. You, you got an hour. Hold on, Bob. You got an hour of a smile content, and then we yeah. did an intermission, and you're complaining about the intermission. The intermission's quite fun. Nobody and- does lo- that long of episodes of anything. Only we do. Of what, movies? Yeah, an hour 45 on Smile 2. Who else did that? No, no one I know. Yeah. Not even Smile 2 did an hour. <laughs> 45. Yeah, we beat the movie. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. They no, were that like, was a long movie. It was like 205. Yeah. Um, no, that's kind of silly because the intermission is just a, a opportunity to chill out and, and lighten up because, you know, we like to have a little fun. Yeah. And then the second half of the episode. And that's all how we interact with listeners. Yeah. But also just fast forward. Fast forward and stop complaining. <laughs> <laughs> we're, oh, I'm so, I'm not, okay, we lost you, Bob. Sorry. We weren't talking about nothing. We were talking about movies. 
And we talked about Smile 2 for 40, for like 55 minutes. Yeah. It was a long episode before we got to the intermission. I specifically remember there being a 15-minute debate before the intermission. Yeah. You had a lot of Smile 2 content before that intermission, bud. You know what, Bob? Do your belching elsewhere. Yeah, I don't give a fuck. (laughs) Anthony, is that all we got? Yeah, that's all we got this week. We have a great new five-star written review. Like I said on Apple Podcasts, I will read every five-star written review, so you all better get typing. Type away. You don't even need an iPhone to make an Apple account. All you need is an email. Just an email. So anyone can do this. Um, All right. Trimmer Guy, five stars. Subject line, best movie podcast, hands down. Everyone put your hands down. Because this is the best movie podcast, according to Trimmer Guy. Here's his review. I thought I wrote a review like three and a half years ago. I am now realizing it was just in my head. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies for the late reviews since I've been listening since 2020. Wow. Love the movies from memories. The Batman and Spider-Man <laughs> ones had me crying laughing. Please do Dark Knight Rises one. Can't wait to see one click. I'm glad to see my donation go to something that's getting all the love and attention it deserves. When you guys are huge directors, I'll always have that flex of knowing you before you were big. Unsubscribed! Trim a guy. What a great review. That Trim a guy. Trim a guy. It sounds so good in Boston accent. long, long ago. 2020. Apologies. <laughs> It was all in my head. <laughs> it was just in my head. Well, I've been listening for a long time, man. That's a long, long fucking time. Fucking hell. Yeah, I love, <laughs> the, I love the Movies from Memories episodes. We should do one the, next. I mean, the Goodfellas one did great. Yeah, which, that, what should we do next? I guess we could do Dark Knight Rises. I mean... But what I want to do is I want to do solo Batman episodes. Around yeah, the, we, we've never done solo Batman episodes. That's what We've been talking about doing that for months. We should do that soon. We should do, we could do a horror one, a horror Movies from Memory. Like, um, so we could finish... We could do more. We've done... Spider-Man, Lord of the Rings, so we could do maybe Two Towers, Spider-Man 2, stuff like that. Or we could do something, something different. Yeah, something fun. I can look at my letterbox and see what I haven't logged for a yeah, while. We do, we do like a Tarantino movie, too, because yeah. we did the Pulp Fiction one. was fun. Yeah. 2001 Space Odyssey. 2001 <laughs> be, Space Odyssey would be, would be... I mean, it wouldn't be... There's not a ton of scenes in that movie. Yeah, but there's a lot to describe. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot yeah. to describe. We could have fun with But that. Trimmer we'll Guy. We'll come up with something cool. Trimmer Guy, thank you so much. Thanks, man. Love the great. review. That was really sweet. Wow. Thank Trim- you so much. Also, Trimmer Guy, Trimmer Guy with the episode with guys with knives for hands. Oh, yeah. I guess. Yeah. You could trim stuff with those knives. We're in a simulation, I bet. Ever scissor hands. So odd. Trimming hair. I think we're in a simulation. The more and more, or fades just catching up to me. What, what did something happen recently? Something recently happened to me. You know, obviously you say something and then you go on your phone, you go on like Instagram or, or whatever and whatever you're talking about pops up. Yeah. I was thinking about something. That's happened to me before. I was thinking about something that I have not seen content for in, I don't think ever, or maybe, who knows, but it's not content that I normally see. I was thinking about it and I opened up the app like an hour later and it was the first video. I was thinking about Dragon Ball Z mm-hmm. and then... The first video was a Dragon Ball Z video. I've fe- I was my I was irked. shook. I felt so creeped out. I, I it blew my because I don't get a lot of anime content or anything like that. I seldom see it. It was the the Raiders TikTok account too that I opened up. When was it? Like freaking two days ago. I don't see you were on Dragon Ball Z binge. Well, I feel like I've had experiences like that before of thinking of something but and then seeing it. But then what made me think about that thing? <laughs> And keep in mind, keep in mind, in mind, <laughs> keep in mind. <laughs> no, it's Tommy Wiseau. Keep in mind. <laughs> no, sorry, I don't know deep tracks to the fucking room, Anthony. <laughs> and if you need any help, keep in mind, Greg. <laughs> no one knows this line. That, like, no. People know that. You don't know that. People, you, someone comment that you know that. Fifteen you got people that. know that line. People, I want, I'm someone that knows. Movie whoever quotes got very that, well, whoever that got that te- Tommy Wiseau line, oh, just please, I, please, continue just what you're saying about. Content. What were you saying? A friend of ours texted us about Dragon Ball Z, the new video game, two days ago. Did so oh. maybe that's the video game? So maybe that made you think of it. You that's for, not what made me think of it. I was thinking of it for a completely different reason, unrelated at all. But to those maybe texts. that's why you saw it on your phone. But I hadn't seen any content about it at ever before. But maybe I don't know. It could have been that text. Still, either even even, even no, but even if it was the text, I wasn't thinking about Dragon Ball Z because of that text. I was thinking about it completely something different. And still, when I popped it up, the coincidence was absurd. Mm-hmm. It is a weird coincidence. I'm not denying that. It's a weird coincidence. But I have, I kind of have an answer for why it was on your phone. But that's not why it was in my head. 
I know it's not why it's in your head. That's why I'm saying it didn't have to do with your thoughts. Yeah, so exactly. That's what I'm saying. No, but <laughs> what if it did? <laughs> what I'm saying is it didn't have to do with what you were thinking. No, but do you understand I know, my case? I know you're talking about just the phone, <laughs> yeah. but I'm talking about just the whole grand scheme of fate and being in a simulation yeah. in life. It's just a crazy coincidence that mm-hmm. I was thinking about it. What part of Dragon Ball Z were you thinking about right before you opened your phone? The relationship between Goku and Gohan. Oh, cute. Cute relationship. And then you opened your phone and it was Dragon Ball Z. Yeah. The video was the relationship between Goku and Gohan. <laughs> it was Goku as a kid. <laughs> it's pretty creepy. It freaked me the fuck out, man. Pretty creepy. But, so then I ask you, did you use TikTok at, before that? I, I, it was Freddy yes. Krueger. It was Freddy Krueger. I don't know. It was a weird day. Sounds, sounds weird, freaked man. freaked me out. It's Anyways, weird. we should probably get on with the intermission. We don't want to, we don't Bob, Bob the Belcher, Belcher to complain. Be <laughs> I came here for Freddy Krueger content. Not anecdotes. <laughs> About your life. I don't care about your lives. Literally, I think he said anecdotes or something like that. Unbelievable. Bob Bol- Bob Belcher. We're just chilling, guy. Fucking hell. Dude, go to a film analysis channel if you want 25 minutes of straight analysis, which we did for 55 minutes. Anyways, Anthony, what's your streaming recommendation for this episode? Nightmare on Elm Street franchise is on Max, but it's leaving soon at the end of October, so watch it while you can. Great pick. <laughs> Was that sarcastic? I... I I haven't even thought about Nightmare on Elm Street in so long. Good thing you brought it up. <laughs> Just kidding. Mine's Poltergeist. Oh, didn't you do Poltergeist recently? I did not. It's on Max. Oh, I think you did. Um, I think you did it for trivia last week. Uh, maybe something like that. Yes. Oh, yeah. Bob Belcher. I think deleted his comment. I pulled it up. It's gone. Good, Bob Belcher. We don't want your bullshit around here. <laughs> He totally deleted it. He because he made two comments. His other comments still there. But, Imagine um, how upset he was commenting. Like I can't believe they're talking. Not <laughs> I can't believe it. They're actually they're actually talking about things not involving the movie. <laughs> what is this? Yeah, he deleted it. I just responded. This is a podcast. It is. A, it's exactly what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Why are they talking? <laughs> <laughs> Imagine listening, watching a podcast and being upset that people are talking on it. <laughs> How dare they talk on this podcast? I didn't come here for talking. It's like going to a restaurant and being pissed off when they bring food to your table. I didn't want food. <laughs> I didn't come here for the food. I came here for the restaurant. <laughs> I came here for tchotchkes. I didn't get any tchotchkes. I just got this burger. <laughs> Does tchotchkes have burgers? I don't fucking know. I've never been to a tchotchkes. Neither have I. <laughs> Chashkis, <laughs> we have the burgers. Anyways, let's get back into a Nightmare on Elm Street. Oh man, because yeah. this movie is just sublime, sublime. I really love it, and I, like I said, I love the way it opens with this sort of short film aspect ratio. It's Freddy's student film. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's his film it's thesis. His yeah, it's... <laughs> but it's cool because we have the aspect ratio is really small, and then we have the the text and everything coming in and the crawl below, beneath it. And then we have Tina's Nightmare, which is a great sequence because, like I think a lot of great horror movies, they give you just a snippet of what you're about to see. They give you like a five, ten minute version of the rest of the movie in a lot of ways. And it's Tina's Nightmare. The she tunnel. Doesn't, she doesn't die in it, but it's some incredible imagery. It's the tunnel. is the first shot we see in the dream world. And what else is in the tunnel with her? A dog. No, a lamb. <laughs> Lambs. Very different. Lambs. <laughs> I knew it had four legs. Sacrificial lamb. Yeah. There's a symbol right there. Symbology. <laughs> Not a dog. <laughs> <laughs> it could have been a dog with a lamb mask. <laughs> you think they cut a dog and put like a lamb sheared sheep skin on Probably it? Probably easier to trade. <laughs> you know lambs walk too. <laughs> they don't. They, they side shuffle up hills. That's it. Those, but I like the... Goats. Uh, goats. This movie shows right off the bat, this shot shows the artificiality of the dream world where she's in a dark tunnel, but the background opening of the tunnel behind her is all pure white impossible it's, that doesn't make sense in the real world so that's your first hint that you're in a dream and also you know i think crucifixes like you said are important in this story it's part of the rhyme and above the girls beds they both have crucifixes uh hanging above their heads and i, I know that used to be a thing that people would sleep with the crucifix above their bed their mantelpiece or, or their headboard um, I, I feel like it's sort of like an old fashioned thing to do, but I mean, this movie's 1980, so old fashioned things and traditional things were still popular and still the norm. But I mean, look at the fashion of this movie. I know, but the connections and the connection's still there. 
But also, <clears throat> you know, Freddy knocks one of the crucifixes down in one of the scenes. You know, it falls while Nancy's asleep. So is the crucifix sort of a defense? And maybe that alludes to and connects to the theory that Freddy's a demon. Yeah, I think that uh, it is a defense. That's why it's in the song. Grab your crucifix because he, you, could, you can look at him as a demon. A demon. A demon. And the characters, again, they're really solid. And some are pretty creepy. Rod's a, a freaking sleazeball creep guy. And Wonder what? something crazy about Rod? Yeah. So the actor who played Rod... <laughs> yeah, it was like you you sounded excited, but your face was like, oh, shut the fuck up. <laughs> I'm I'm actually Bob Belcher. And you looked the, away. I'm Bob Belcher. <laughs> the actor who played Rod, um, he's reformed now and clean, but he was a drug addict and homeless before he got the role. In the scene uh, where his name was uh, Jisoo Garcia. I don't know how to pronounce that first name. JSU. I'm sorry. Shu Garcia. I don't know how to say it. Um, but he... How dare you? <laughs> you? How do you pronounce it? J-Suit. J-Suit. <laughs> he um, was actually high on heroin in the prison scene when he's lying in the bed. And the actress, Heather Langerkamp, thought he was doing like a phenomenal job acting as like this dazed, sleep, uh, bedridden, uh, insomniac character. But really, he was high on heroin. I believe he was snorting it in the bathroom in between takes. Yeah. Because if he, if he had injected it, obviously, obviously he'd be it, it's on the fucking ground. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I read that. It's pretty wild. It's pretty crazy. But sorry, Actually, continue. Um, what was I talking about? <laughs> I can't remember. My story was way better. It was a good story. Yeah. No, but I mean, the characters are great. So we have Rod, who is the, you, I couldn't assume, on again, off again, boyfriend of Tina, who you think is the lead character, but obviously it's a horror movie, so... Usually the opening girl gets killed early on in the film, which she does die in the first act. And then we have Nancy, who's the main character of the film, the final girl of A Nightmare on Elm Street, and her boyfriend, Glenn, played by Johnny Depp. And, you know, typical classic adolescent teens in, ho- in movies, and they're obsessed with sex. And the sex scene is really <laughs> funny. And it's funny, yeah. It's loud and raucous where Glenn's trying to sleep and you can hear them having sex above them. But... You know, the characters, I think, are really well fleshed out. And I think everyone gave a great performance. And everyone seems young enough to be in high school. They fit the, the age of Bill really well. And, and I think just everyone, you know, knew their character, performed super well. I think Johnny Depp, honestly, was awesome in this movie. I know you said he didn't have it yet. Not his Johnny stuff. Yeah, obviously he's saying. not. Yeah. He's not Jack Sparrow That's what I'm yet. saying, yeah. But there's some, he had it. You could tell yeah, he, he, had, had, he yeah. had the it factor. Yeah. yeah. He's the most interesting, I think, actor in the movie besides Robert England. And, of course, Heather is terrific as, as Nancy in this movie. Um, but I think the main cast just does a really solid job with this film. Oh yeah, they did a good job with the budget of like putting this whole movie together. And the plot's really brilliant. You know, we have these four teens, they live all in the same area, and they're all having nightmares of the same guy. And obviously Tina has hers in the opening of the film, and then she starts bringing it up to Nancy, and Nancy's like, I had a dream about a guy. He had knives for fingers. And then Glenn, you can tell, hears and recognize like I had a dream like that too but he doesn't say it yet he's been trying he hides the whole time that he's been dreaming about Freddy typical too. guy behavior and what's cool about his character and that whole aspect of it is he never admits it until and then he's dying and you can tell when he's dying he kind of when he's dying I think he knows it's Freddy because mm-hmm. he says he's like no no because he's been hiding that he's been seeing Freddy as well Yeah. but also Rod's been seeing the same guy in his dreams so these, th- these four characters these four teenagers who live in the same area on the same street we can assume are all having nightmares about the same guy. And you could assume that all of their parents were pivotal parts of the group that lynched and killed and burned Fred Krueger mm-hmm. back in the day. You could assume that like their parents specifically were the ringleaders, which is why Freddy chose those kids. Because Marge still has the glove with knives on it, so I think they were like the ringleaders of the parents from like a decade ago. Yeah, I, 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 I'd buy that as well. And... Even Glenn's parents, maybe they were probably involved too. And that's they had maybe, to have been. Maybe that's why yeah. his father's so defensive about you know not wanting him to be around Nancy anymore. Yeah, and what's because really she's getting a little loony, he says. Yeah, what's so cool about the film is though, the kills are fantastic, and as amazing as the special effects work is in Tina's death, and it's so phenomenal the set. I also just really love the slash across the chest, um, the how they practically did that. I'm guessing it was. 
maybe it was stop motion how they did that oh the, like the prosthetic yeah his test get, yeah. his chest getting slashed open yeah it's gotta be that's gotta be stop motion or something it's so good at seamless and the idea of like this invisible killer and rod being there not seeing anyone it's a, it's such a great way to open the film and get the audience up to speed with how unpredictable the film is going to be how scary and chaotic and how powerful this being is um and even though we see that happen, it still makes you question what's real or not, especially Nancy questioning what's real or not, until when she pulls the hat out of the dream. I think that's officially confirmed for her that what's happening is absolutely real. Yeah, we're blending surrealism with reality. Nancy falling asleep in school and seeing Tina's body inside the body bag, talking to her and then being dragged all the way down the hallway, you know, following that long blood trail and seeing the young girl with the hall pass, the hall monitor inside Freddy's sweat with wearing Freddy's sweatshirt. It's really interesting. But that surrealist quality of always being lured into the boiler room, which is where we eventually find out Freddy Krueger was killed. He was killed in a boiler room that he used to always live in and hang out in after the parents of the area after finding out and discovering that he was the child murderer, the local child murderer, burning him alive inside his boiler room, this is really Freddy's lair. This is where he coaxes and lures people in. Yeah, I mean, he got what he deserved, obviously, because he got off scot-free because the warrant of his arrest wasn't signed for properly or something. Like, what was it? I love that little loophole. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, someone forgot, didn't sign. Sign it, have a signature. Yeah. So it, the whole trial was annulled. I mean... You can't blame him for killing that guy. Oh, you can't blame the parents? Yeah. Oh, I do the same thing. You can't blame the parents. Absolutely. Because then he's going to kill more kids. But what... <laughs> and the parents, they're dealing with it in their own way. Obviously, Nancy's mom is an alky. Her father is just obviously just consumed by his work, and which probably both things led to her parents being separated. The other parents we don't know too much about. Obviously, we only meet two sets of parents at the end of the day. And Tina's parents don't seem to be home very often, so who knows where they are. But, you know, the, the way that the parents know something's wrong or they know something about what's happening and they, they're they hiding it and gaslighting their kids, they're gaslighting Nancy, it's really strong for the story and for the audience as well because when Nancy first name drops Fred Krueger to them in the kitchen, or I mean inside... She, she says it to the mom, you're right, in the kitchen with the hat, and then she says it again after the funeral to, to both the, of them. To both of them, yeah. And you can tell in the look in their eyes that they know who Fred Krueger is. And, and I like that, that that hiding of information from our main characters, from the audience as well, for a good amount of time. And there's no need to do a flashback. I'm looking at you, Remake. I'm looking right at you, Remake. Well, because the studios in the 2000s are obsessed with origin stories. Let's, let me just, origin let me stories. just talk about the Remake for a little bit. 20, 2010. 2010. Yeah, 2010. Jackie Earl Haley as Freddy Krueger. Numi replaces Nancy. They basically did the same exact story. Um, just with CGI and technology, all the same characters, same plot, but they did so much. There's so much more Freddy. There's there's flashbacks of when Freddy before he was burned, of him taking kids, of him um, bonding with kids uh, to lure them, and then the burning uh, and the parents killing him. And it's like it, you was like, what was the whole like? There's no point in showing any of this. This move first movie works so well because we never even saw the flashback. You can just tell. Just from the reactions of all the parent characters, uh, so Nancy's parents, like how how gruesome it was, and it was you don't need that flashback. It's Rooney Mara. Oh my God, did I say Numi Rapace? Yeah, I was. I was like, sorry, sorry, like, Rooney Mara. Numi Rapace. She wasn't even girl dragging the tattoo. Rooney yet. Mara. That's what threw me off. Yeah, I've mixed them together. You're gonna of continue. That. Sorry, I I pictured Rooney Mara, but I said Numi Rapace. Yeah. Um, and then Jackie Earl Haley played it with no charisma. And just like, I'm scary. He was sort of Rorschach. Yeah. Because he had just done Watchmen. Yeah. The prosthetic face looked really bad. Yeah. It looked awful. Uh, because they made it too realistic looking, and he lost any kind of features, and it, it had no character anymore. It's just like... Yeah, because Freddy with Robert England, you can, he can still move his mouth and yes. face as much. You see all exactly. of his facial muscle and expressions, but the yeah. Jackie Earl Haley was literally looked like a burn victim where your face is just solid from the burning and your exactly. muscles can't move. And also, they used CGI, so they did kind of a two-faced thing like they did in Dark Knight, where they had green mark. They had some pro they had mostly prosthetics, but then in inner layers, there were green. Um, there was green makeup, and then they CGI'd like the inner parts of his jaw. And it's just like on some of the close-ups, 
it's clearly CGI and it looks terrible. It's like, why are you guys doing CGI in Freddy's face at all? That makes absolutely no sense to do that. Just, just make it a prosthetic that he can act with. And the tone of it was awful. It was just the same movie, same shots, duplicating so much of it. And CGI, like, sometimes characters would, like, be in one room and then snap of a finger from Freddy and they're in the dream world. And it, the CGI, they would do that with CGI and it didn't look good at all. And on top of that, the director said that... And Jack Earl Ailey, he's a very good actor. Um, I respect the guy. He's, he had not watched the movie before he did the role. He had never seen any Freddy Krueger movies. And then the night before filming started, he watched A Nightmare on Elm Street, the first one. He said it was the worst movie he'd ever seen. Mm. And that's a weird attitude to have when you're going into the remake. You know, I feel like that was just yeah. like, that's a weird place to come from, acting wise. Like, oh, that was the worst movie. I'm gonna, are you gonna do better than that? I don't get it. That movie just overall was awful. One of the worst remakes ever. It was a movie I think people were excited about too. Yeah, because remakes weren't yeah off the chains and just being done every eight months, every two months. Mm-hmm. But you know, I, I remember being excited about that movie and oh, cool, new new Freddy movie. This this could be awesome because I, I think there's a lot of potential in a Freddy you know, movie. I think the new Halloween movies were doing pr- were they out by then? Like the the Rob Zombie ones. And I I like the Rob Zombie Halloween. Rob ones. Zombie one started before 2010. Yeah, so I was yeah. so I think people were, had high hopes for it. And like, oh, I think this might work. Yeah, because I think it was working with Halloween. There's a lot of potential to a good <laughs> contemporary Freddy movie. You could it could be pulled off really well, but it, he just they just ruined it. Yeah, I think someone like Blumhouse has to scoop that property up. You could make a really cool movie with modern technology and... It's a remake yeah. I would be totally down for. Yeah, me too. New ad- so adaptation. Because there's, there's already been, been nine in that, so it's not a big deal. It's not like it's a holy grail anymore. Yeah, it's not like Lawrence of Arabia being remade. It's totally different. <laughs> but again, this this movie's terrific. And so, obviously, after Tina's death, which is one of the most exciting scenes of the movie, possibly the best scene, which, like Anthony said, an invisible attacker, the invisible slashes, her dying on the ceiling and then falling and just bleeding out everywhere. The blood everywhere and... When Glenn and Nancy walk into the room, is shocking and jarring. And also, I think Glenn's death is really exciting, too. Mm-hmm. You know, we talked about it earlier where they spun the room upside down, but the gore- the geyser of blood shooting out of his mattress is just awesome after Freddy pulls him in. And then, obviously, the TV version, his skeleton pulling out. But then, just his room covered in blood, <clears throat> and then blood dripping through his floor, through the ceiling of the bottom floor, across the street from Nancy's house while their father's looking up, is just so incredible. I've never seen that before, ever. You Obviously, see, you see water leaks in, in movies, but a blood leak through the floor and ceiling yeah, yeah. is epic. That's good. I, and I love all the reactions of all the cops and the coroners vomiting in the other room. That's yeah. how grisly it is. And I, I really love, you see it twice in the movie, this, like, portal, this bright, smoke-filled portal that Freddy uses to get into the real world, and he takes people, and he, you see it in... It's similar to Beetlejuice. Yeah, in uh, Poltergeist. Yeah. Similar to Poltergeist. He pulls Glenn into it, and then he, he kills Marge at the end of the film. Uh, and she descends into that portal, and Nancy and, his, and her dad watch it. It's like, oh, he's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> like, what the fuck? Shit, this is real. It's insane. But it's, uh, it reminds me of, of Poltergeist, and it's super fun. And also, that scene, how much did you love that fire burn, man? It's really great fire burn. So that fire burn was done in one one take. They set up several cameras in the in the basement. And what happens is she lights Freddy on fire, and then the stunt actor who did it, who's actually at the time the longest ever fire burn recorded, it wasn't meant to be. But so the pl- the blocking of the scene was he gets lit on fire and he runs up the stairs after her. But the stunt actor did an improv where he f- he ran up the stairs, tripped and fell back down, and then he got up again and ran back up the steps. <clears throat> that was not planned, but he he added it. Um, thinking it would work better. And so it ended up being the longest fire burn for the time. That's incredible. And what I love about it is his fire footprints that mm. lead the way to where he ends up I in, love in the, the bedroom footprints. upstairs is so cool. But Nancy, again, is is a terrific character. She goes through a lot of growth in this movie. And she's starting to catch on quick. If I fall asleep, I'm dead. You know, she does the test inside her dream when she's in school where she's in the boiler room. And she puts her arm against the hut pipe to wake herself up. And then in the real world, she has a burn on her forearm, as well as she tries to experiment experiment with the rules of the dream world. Obviously, she's put inside that sleep study by her mother, and she's woken up by them after she goes into a nightmare. Also, the doctor of the sleep institute is the guy from Zodiac with the basement, the poster designer. Crazy. We were we were watching it, and James was like, "Wait, is that?" And we were like. 
Zodiac. Yeah, Are you kidding time. me? It's the same actor. Same guy. Unbelievable. Awesome, awesome creepy performance in Zodiac, but you, you can't miss him in, in Nightmare on Elm Street. And so she started to experiment with the rules of reality in her dream world and her plan. She has another plan. She hatches lots of plans in this movie. She wants Glenn to wake her up as she goes looking for somebody when she's going to go looking for, obviously, Freddy later on the film. Or which, which one is it when she goes to try and find Rod? Is that without Glenn waking her up? That's with Glenn waking her up. She's, she, that's the plan. Okay, but he doesn't yeah, wake her up. So, he doesn't wake her up. Yeah, so she wants to go into the dream world because she wants to see if Freddy's going to go after Rod while Rod's in prison because he does go after him. And then when she goes in the dream, this is where... Glenn fell asleep in the chair next to her bed, and then obviously she set an alarm which woke herself up, right? And she got mm-hmm. out of that dream that yeah. way. There's the backup, the pissed, alarm. Pissed off at Glenn for that. You shit! You little shit! But that's a really cool, cool sequence where she's starting to experiment with reality and dream world, and also a cool nod to Evil Dead 2, which is yeah. on the TV screen in this movie during that sequence as well. Yeah, and it was also a, a foreshadow to what how Glenn would end up dying. You know, nap. He he couldn't help from napping, and obviously... It led to his death in the next night. Yeah, and yeah, obviously after Rod's death, we have the funeral sequence. And at the cemetery we talked about earlier where she brings up Fred Krueger and her parents are acting like they don't know who it is, but really they do. We have the Venice sequence with the burgers. <laughs> and then the finale of the movie, it's a really great, I think, last 30 minutes where she has this big ultimate plan. Obviously, she comes home. Her mom's barred up the windows and doors and shows her Freddy Krueger's glove in the burner that she's been hiding for decades down in the basement in the cellar. And she now has a plan where she's going to pull Freddy out of her dream because she's already done it with the hats. And then Glenn is going to wait with the baseball bats and bash him and whack him when she pulls him out of the dream. Yeah, what's the uh, term he uses twice? Like, uh, oh, I can't remember that old-timey way of saying I'm going to knock you out. I can't remember. Uh, I'm gonna knock your lights out or something. Yeah, like knock that? your lights out. Yeah. yeah, he says it twice. He says it in the garden. Yeah, I mean the backyard. Rent, rent Rod. <laughs> the car. I can't even call it a garden. I'm becoming British. <laughs> <laughs> I love the ending. I love the the big finale. I lo- I think the booby traps are super fun, and I remember just being a kid and when she's in. The- I remember the boiler room. Always just terrifying me as a kid, and I, I used to have nightmares about it. And the boiler room was actually a dangerous shooting location. It was shot in the basement of the Lincoln Heights Jail in Los Angeles, not far from us in Lincoln Heights. Uh, But the building was condemned shortly after production wrapped because uh, it had high levels of asbestos. Mm. So (laughs) hopefully they didn't shoot in there too long. Yeah, that's scary. But... When it comes to the finale, in the whole film, just great attention to detail. One bit bit of attention to detail I think is great is Nancy's graying hair. Yes, the stri- she got yeah. sort of the rogue hair yeah, going. I love it. And also the the coffee, the constant drinking of coffee <laughs> and obviously caffeine pills. But when she's pretending to be asleep and her mother puts her to bed, takes out her way her coffee pot and her mugs, then she pulls out a fresh hot pot from under her bed and a mug from <laughs> a under her whole pillow. Brewer. It's so funny. It's a whole brewer. It's a really in there. funny sequence right before yeah. things are gonna go down. She likes her coffee hot. Likes it. I yeah. mean, coffee's best when it's hot for yeah. sure. And debatable. Again, Third act's great, though. She goes into the dream. She can't find Freddy because Freddy's maybe on to something. Like, what's she doing? And she eventually pulls Freddy out, and her dad's not there to come and rescue her. After their wrestling match. <laughs> but they do a great job because you think she got out of the dream and she'd failed. And then he jumps up from behind her bed. And she it's thinks a great she's crazy. Jump. Yeah. yeah. And then they have their fight. Again, Freddy, you got to work on your ground game, man. Go, go sign up at a BJJ, some Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Just lead with the knives. Oh, yeah, lead with the knives. <laughs> Leading with the knives can work. Uh, but maybe he's trying to grab her to bring her to the dream world. That's why he's not trying to kill her in this moment. Maybe. And they have their sequence. But like we said, leading to him being lit on fire and then lighting the mother on fire in March's bed up in the second floor. It's great. It's great. Absolutely insane. There Bonkers. is a campy humor to it. Like when she's screaming for help and the other officer's like, maybe I should go tell the captain. Yeah. <laughs> There is some good humor. It's like this campy crunch that, humor. That part makes me scream, man. Yeah. I'm like, go fucking save her! <laughs> She's breaking windows. Maybe she'll, maybe go check on her. <laughs> it's really good. It's incredible. And the, the ending's amazing. Like you said, Marge gets taken into the dream world by Freddy after her skeleton. She's been turned into ash, basically. She's a shriveled up, burnt skeleton. And then... Nancy, you know, after having that conversation with Glenn 
about how dream voyeurs sort of are able to combat bad dreams or, or nightmarish figures in their dreams by turning your back on it and not giving it any energy. She does this. She's like, I figured out the secret. To, I figured out your secret. And then she turns her back on Freddy, who's trying to bring her, and says, I give you no more of the energy that I've been giving you. And I want my friends back. I want my mother back. And I want everything to go back to normal. And then she wakes up. Pennywise style. And then it's a beautiful It's sunny a great day. transition. She walks through the door, and then yeah. she exits the door outside in the daytime. It's beautiful yeah. out. It's sunny. It's foggy. Her mom is this odd fairy tale-esque quality to her. She's like floating and I'm very I'm going to stop Greek drinking. <laughs> and Nancy's very happy, and her friends pull up in Glenn's convertible, and they all get in the convertible. And, of course, they put the convertible down, and the windows go up. They don't know what's happening, and the green and red... Stripes of the convertible top are revealed to the audience because Nancy's dreaming. And who knows how long she's been dreaming. And what's cool about it, it could have been a dream for, you know, the last half of the movie. Yeah, the whole thing. And then Marge gets pulled through the window door. <laughs> the door window. <laughs> the dummy of Marge. <laughs> <laughs> it's clearly a dummy, but yeah, it works, it works. Man. it works. It's funny. It works. Especially when you're young, it works. I think it's fine. Yeah, I, I think it absolutely holds up. And the book ending I mean, with the fairy tale. Yeah, this, there's so many things that work. I, I love the uh, the phone with the tongue and mouth on it. It's yeah. a fun jump scare. I really love um, Tina in the body bag talking to her. Me too. I feel like a lot of horror movies uh, pulled from that, the idea of like the bloody friend dead talking to them. And I think what's so alluring about this franchise and this character in the world is dreams and nightmares. We still don't know what they are. Just like they didn't back in the 1980s when this movie was made. As the doctor says, we still don't know what they are. They're a mystery. We have ideas of what they could be. But we really don't really understand them completely. And I think that's one of the most exciting things about Freddy Krueger and a villain who haunts your nightmares. Did you know that in your dreams, all of your faces are not... The faces of people you see in your dreams, they're not... Your, your mind doesn't create the faces you see and the people you see. They're all memories of people you've seen. Yeah, that's what people have, have yeah. said. I've heard that. that you don't actually create them. Everything's created from things you've seen or memories you have. Hmm. It could be a movie or a photograph. Uh, it's all stored in your brain somewhere. And that's where all the creation comes from. You're not actually um, boring at all. It's not born from like pure creativity. It's actually put together from your everything you're collected in your mind. So I'm not a creative guy, I guess. No, I mean, you can still be creative with, with how you build the world, but is, is joke. Yeah, all the faces are actually faces you've seen in reality. Yeah, I've heard that before. I've heard that. I think that's interesting. Yeah. But how can they know that if we can't see all of our dreams? I think based upon the certain areas of the brain that light up when people sleep, and it's like the same areas as memories. Maybe. The memory area. Maybe. I think that's how they do it. Maybe. You know, I'm not a scientist. I'm sure in like 50 years we'll be able to see dreams. Uh, Like record them? Yeah, put like something hooked up to your head. Sounds like a Black Mirror episode. I mean, technology's booming, man. Yeah, you should, you should write a little Black Mirror pilot. About that? Yeah. A Black Mirror pilot about seeing your dreams. I'm sure it's already been done. No. Every idea has been done. No, that hasn't been done. For Black Mirror? Yeah. No, I mean, I'm just saying that it's probably been done in a movie. I can't think of it. I'm sure it's. I'm sure there's a movie where people can see dreams. I'm just saying it's a great idea and you should pursue it. Oh, thanks, man. I have not it. seen it. But that doesn't mean it. But I mean, even if I did, I've write, seen every movie. No, no, you haven't. <laughs> but I mean, even if it's if it's if I've never seen a movie, it's been done. But I mean, it still would be a cool script. Yeah, yeah. Every every idea has been done a dozen times. Take the compliment. No, I, no, I appreciate it. I'm, <laughs> James, you came up with a great idea. You should write it. It's been done. It's been no, done. I mean, I'm not saying that that's no reason not to write a story because it's been done before. It's be, I mean, everything's been done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Especially now. I'm just saying I can't think of a movie that did that. I think it's a fresh idea. Movie where you can see dreams. But where, I mean, where dreams are shown. Just have to figure out a plot then. That's the whole point. Yeah. I mean, I mean what's the plot then? I don't know. It's for you to figure out, man. You have to figure out a mystery. You got the idea. Of the dream. You have a good idea, I think. You should, um, you should write it down. That's a, it's a Black Mirror episode. It's a good Black Mirror Probably, episode. Probably, yeah. It, that'd be... A, That's what I'm saying. It's perfect for Black Mirror. Interesting Black Mirror episode. We'll, uh, we'll put together a pitch deck. Oh, yeah. And send it to Black Mirror. That's what we'll do. Black Mirror will be like, no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no, they they need ideas, man. They probably have so many. They have an abundance of ideas. I bet that they buy feature scripts 
from like sci-fi like they're probably feature film scripts that they yeah, use would, for the I show. I wouldn't be surprised. Some of them seem, some of the episodes seem like they would work really well as movies, but yeah. maybe they just never got made. So hey, let's yeah, make it an I episode think, of TV. I think so. Yeah. At least the first couple of seasons, because now I think people write specifically geared towards this a Blackbird episode, thing. like a format of an episode yeah, of a I TV. Think, I think you're right. I think you're right. But I wouldn't be surprised if the first couple of seasons were like, hey, that's a script. That's cool. Let's turn that into a TV episode. Yeah, I think you're right. But we have no clue but that's an interesting theory do you have any more information that you'd like to share with i have some, on a some fun Street? facts let me see if we said my fun facts we did say a lot of them because you were so well versed in the freddy lore and background da, 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 da. well i have something cool so even though the budget was about 1.8 million dollars to produce the film yes only fifty-seven thousand dollars was reserved for the special effects budget, which was ambitious for that budget. Whoa! But Jim Doyle, the effects designer, accepted anyways because he was desperate for work. It's all on the screen, I bet. Uh, the film was selected for preservation by the long by, li- by the Library of Congress for cultural significance. La- Congress, big fan of Freddy. Congress loves Freddy, apparently. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense. I mean, it's a huge part of the genre. Huge part of the genre. Yeah, I think you said all of my fun facts and your own fun facts. Yeah. Lots, yeah. lots of cool things about this movie, but I had a blast talking about it. Oh, do you want to hear the, the original ending? Yes. The happy one that happy. Wes Craven wanted? Yeah. So Nancy kills Kruger by ceasing to believe in him, blah, blah, blah. Then awakens to discover that everything that happened in the movie was an elongated nightmare. Elongated? Yeah, elongated, <laughs> elongated nightmare. Robert Eng- Eglund. So at, the whole movie was a nightmare. Gotcha. And then she woke up into reality. Then she says goodbye to her mother, drives to school with her friends. Um, but then Robert Shea, the producer at Lionsgate, wanted a twist ending that would leave the way open for sequels, hence. It's a way stronger ending to do it. The it's way, a better ending. Yeah, yeah. It is it's a fun. lot better. Yeah. Because I will say when Freddy dissolves into digitization, yeah. for me it's not amazing if that's the ending. 40 years ago it looked cool, but yeah, I it's, agree. It's so abrupt yeah. for how strong the character is in the film. But to have it all be a dream, I think that's the best strength of it. Yeah. Wes Craven hated the ending idea, though. Yeah, you already brought that up earlier. Yeah, he hated it, but he still shot it because Shay was the money guy. Hey, money talks. <laughs> money but um, talks. I don't think the happy ending would have worked. No, I mean, either no way. I don't think so either. No. It would not be the movie it is because it's an awesome ending. Imagine seeing that in theaters in the 80s. With that sound effect of like that wind yeah. and the crash. It's really it's cool. fucking great. Awesome. All right, that's uh, all my fun facts. All right, well, thank you, everyone, for tuning into our episode on A Nightmare on Elm Street. Hopefully you enjoyed this spooky episode. I'm talking to you, Bob Belcher, specifically. Bob Belcher. If you lasted I hope you long. liked our small talk. <laughs> we did it multiple times just for you. Thanks for tuning in. Become a patron today at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Leave those five-star ratings and reviews on Spotify and Apple. Subscribe on YouTube. Do all the things. Hit all the right buttons with your fingers on your phones. And take care, everybody. See you next time. This episode was brought to you by our Chosen One patrons, Jacob Kostler and Nicholas Martin. Thanks so much, boys. Raiders of the Lost podcast is a Mirror Image production. Sound mixing done by Jacob Kostler. Opening music by Chase Jackson.